All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lisa Williams, and I am the Associate Curator at the New Britain Museum of American Art, which is uh, one of, if not the oldest museums dedicated to American art. And I'm delighted that you can join us this evening for a discussion on women, art, and activism in honor of and following the 2020 centennial of women's suffrage in America. Tonight's talk is organized and presented by the New Britain Museum of American Art in collaboration with partnering institution, the Norman Rockwell Museum. And we're joined in conversation by two esteemed colleagues who I am pleased to introduce. Stephanie Plunkett is the deputy director and chief curator at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, she has curated numerous exhibitions relating to the art of illustration and has held previous positions at Brooklyn Museum, the Brooklyn Children's Museum and the Heckscher Museum of Art. She leads the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies, the first scholarly institute devoted to the study of illustration. And her recent publications include The Shifting Postwar Marketplace, Illustration in the United States and Canada, 1940 to 1970, as well as Drawing Lessons from the Famous Artist School, Classic Techniques and Expert Tips from the Golden Age of Illustration. Also joining us is Mary Burley, Chief Educator at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Ms. Burley leads the museum's DEAI initiatives and has served as chief educator at the museum since 2018, after having worked as an educator and public school administrator for over two decades. Working with a broad range of constituencies, Burley has designed successful public humanities programs at the museum, securing the participation of scholars and subject matter experts. Burley is the museum representative to community collaborations with Brainworks, Multicultural Bridge, and other region-wide initiatives. So thank you so much, Stephanie and Mary, for joining this evening. Lisa, thank you so much for having us. And uh, thank you to wonderful Lisa Lappy, also behind the scenes. We are thrilled to, <laughs> thrilled to be with you. So what brings the New Britain Museum of American Art and the Norman Rockwell Museum together in collaboration is our shared commitment to celebrating the work. Let's see how I advance. Okay, here we go. Celebrating the work of women artists also to increasing uh, representation of women artists as well as diversity in our museums, particularly as demonstrated in our 2020 exhibition programming. So without having planned in advance, we have discovered a tremendous synergy in the exhibitions that both of our institutions um, have presented. And, and uh, as you can see here, a sampling of images. So I'll share a bit of context about what we have on view at the New Britain Museum of American Art, and then we'll pass the conversation on to Stephanie and Mary. So tonight's program accompanies our current exhibition, Some Days Now, Women, Art, and Social Change, which presents historic ephemera from the women's suffrage movement together with the work of 20th century and contemporary artists who advocate for women's rights and social justice for all. Some Days Now is part of a major initiative launched by the museum in January of 2020 entitled 2020, 20 Plus Women at NBMAA, which celebrates the invaluable contributions of women to the arts and seeks to increase representation of their works in the museum. So as part of the uh, initiative, we have dedicated all of our special exhibitions throughout 2020 and into 2021 to the work of female identifying artists. And we've also reinterpreted our permanent collection galleries and are also focusing on acquisitions of work by women artists to increase representation and diversity in our galleries. So we are tremendously grateful to our presenting sponsor, Stanley Black & Decker, with additional support from Bank of America. So with that, uh, thank you again, Stephanie and Mary. And I wanna offer you an opportunity to share a little bit about your programs. And of course, tonight's discussion will unfold um, from and weave together all of these exhibitions that we have organized around 2020 and the centennial of women's suffrage in America. So. Um, I'm excited to hear more about what you have at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Absolutely, thank you so much. And um, you know, we, uh, as Lisa will be sh sharing as we move through our slides, uh, we were fortunate to organize an exhibition focused on the art of Rose O'Neill, who was uh, actually an artist and suffragette. And our presentation will take you uh, through uh, a little bit of O'Neill's work and some other pioneering illustrators uh, who were female, uh, but also a little bit of Norman Rockwell, who was definitely an ally to a uh, women's cause. And uh, right up until a project that we did much more recently called the Unity Project, focusing on inspiring people to vote. And so some of the art that we'll show you from that project was done by very 
uh, prominent and, and really prolific female illustrators. So starting with the first slide, uh, I will just mention to you that as thrilled as I am to be with you, if you see me drop away at a quarter of seven, it's only because we have another program this evening uh, at the Norman Rockwell Museum. But I'm gonna begin with this slide and you see here Rose O'Neill herself, the artist and suffragette, which uh, was featured in a, as I said, a special permanent collection exhibition here at the museum to honor the 100th anniversary since women were formally given the right to vote, a cause to which Rose O'Neill was strongly devoted. A popular illustrator in the late 19th century and early 20th, who achieved extraordinary success in a male dominated field, O'Neill worked tirelessly to promote the rights of women to vote by taking part in protests, speaking to groups, and by creating protest signs, magazine illustrations, and postcards featuring her famous QBs, which we'll hear uh, more about in a minute. Just to provide a little historical background, uh, you probably know that the 15th Amendment to the US Constitution was ratified in 1870. And although it guaranteed the right to vote regardless of quote, race, color, or previous condition of servitude, women were still denied voting rights. After passing through Congress on June 4th, 1919 and receiving the necessary approval of three fourths of the states on August 18th, 1920, the 19th Amendment was officially ratified by the US Secretary of State on August 26, 1920, and the amendment states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So maybe we can go to the next illustration, the next slide. Importantly, O'Neill broke new ground for women in the worlds of art and publishing, and she used her platform as a popular artist to help secure the rights of women to vote. She grew up amazingly in a sod house in rural Nebraska, but her parents surrounded her with books and music and encouraged her to draw. As you can see here, she was a wonderful draftsman. She first achieved success at the age of 13, when she won a drawing prize from the Omaha World Herald and through her teenage years, her work appeared in regional newspapers. At the age of 19, she moved to New York City and her work was soon published in Truth, Life, Harper's Bazaar, Cosmopolitan and Good Housekeeping. And interestingly, uh, a comic strip that she wrote titled The Old Subscriber Calls was printed in September 1896 in Truth, and it was notably the first published comic strip created by a woman. Next slide. This uh, wonderful QB doll was on view in our exhibition, um, and it was her, uh, the QB was actually O'Neill's most popular creation, uh, born in 1909 although uh, these figures had appeared in her work for years. The Cupid uh, was named after Cupid, the Roman god of love, uh, and they were childlike winged elfish creatures sporting a top knot hairstyle. I'm wondering how many of you remember the Cupies because they were popular for quite a few years. The Cupies were an instant success and the characters were prominently featured on the pages of popular magazines. Um, interestingly, O'Neill uh, worked with a German factory to produce uh, literally millions of dolls in all sizes, making her a millionaire and uh, her career in illustration continued. She wrote several popular books featuring, featuring Cupies and she became the top artist for Jell-O, Kellogg's and Eastman Kodak. So she was quite amazing. Next one. So as you can see here, uh, the Cupies appeared in posters, placards, and postcards promoting the right of women to vote. So of course this one says, give mother the vote, our food, our health, our play, our homes, our schools, our work. Um, and there's the Cupie uh, standing for that important movement. Thank you, Lisa. 
So that ties in perfectly with the display of uh, historical ephemera that we have on view as part of Someday is Now Women, Art, and Social Change. And I'll point out at the top right, uh, the a poster that very much resembles the one we just looked at by Rose O'Neill with the famous Cupid dolls. So in the late 1800s, uh, members of the women's suffrage movement organized peaceful democratic strategies to uh, ra raise awareness about their cause, about uh, voting rights and to generate support. And some of those activities included marches and rallies, symposiums, talks, they published uh, pamphlets and brochures with information about voting. But an another important part of this initiative was the production of this visual media. And scholar Alison Lang has described that the women's suffrage movement represented the first major visual campaign in American history, which is pretty incredible to think about was almost the first major marketing campaign in essence. And particularly in the early 1900s, um, these groups of women suffragists, uh, which included women and men, were very savvy, very well organized, and hired illustrators and art directors and marketing agents to help them design, develop, uh, produce, and distribute the posters like those we see here. So these posters would be seen at rallies and at marches, um, which get which received a lot of um, publicity. So images of these events would be reproduced in newspapers that were consumed by a broad public. And pro-suffrage publications like Puck Magazine also reproduced images like these in their pages and encouraged readers to tear them out and pin them on their walls. So these images were very powerful because they reached broad masses. You didn't need a higher education to understand what they were. Um, of what they were conveying. And the illustrators, the designers, combined text and image in really impactful ways to educate the public about voting rights, spread messages of social change, and also galvanize politicians to make policy change like the eventual ratification of the 19th Amendment. So you see a variety of the visual strategies that were utilized. Um, the map, the, the map of America, often featured in suffrage posters as did references to classical antiquity, like we see at the top left, and the use of um, the, the depiction of women and children as in the work of Rose O'Neill. So also included in Someday, Net, Someday Is Now are vintage photographs from the women's suffrage movement. And we see here banners and posters in use. Uh, the image at the top left represents a women's suffrage march that took place in Hartford, Connecticut. And I want to point out here uh, something that you will find fairly consistent in the historical photography of women's suffrage marches, and that is the predominance of white garments. <laughs> and uh, white has often been, the color white has often been synonymous with suffrage. I'm just coincidentally wearing white tonight. Um, but it was highly strategic. These marches were taking place um, before the era of color photography. And you can see in black and white photography, uh, the figures wearing white really stand out. So when uh, documentation of these suffrage marches were being reproduced in newspapers, um, members of the women's suffrage mo movement who were marching really presented a strong visual presence in these images. So it was highly strategic, um, this use of white garments, and that has become sort of part of the sort of legacy of suffrage. To the right, we see photographs of voter rally uh, events, uh, voter registration rallies, that is. And these photographs post-date the ratification of the 19th Amendment. In fact, these are from 1956. And the reason why we feature these images in the exhibition is twofold. One is that you know, we see the predominance and the continued use of this uh, visual media in, in ways that continue to encourage voting, uh, continue participation, continue advocating for uh, participation in the vote. Uh, some of these posters uh, continue to combine image and text. One says, let's vote now. They are voting, are you? But the other reason why we have included these images in Someday Is Now is to really underscore the fact that even decades after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, women from Black communities, um, people of color, uh, 
um, continue to face discrimination at the polls, whether through state manda mandated poll taxes or literacy tests or um, intimidation that prevented them from casting a ballot. So not until 1965 was the Voting Rights Act passed uh, federally prohibiting uh, discrimination at the polls. And yet we know having come out of a recent presidential election that voter suppression continues to be pervasive um, today in our current moment. It's remarkable how current these issues have remained as Lisa points out. Um, just in, with a little more historical background for years, as she said, the drive for women's suffrage was uh, presented mainly as the story of middle-class white women and iconic national leaders like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That story began in Seneca Falls at the convention in upstate New York in 1848, and it ended with the triumphant adoption of the 19th Amendment. And this resulted in the single largest extension of democratic voting rights in American history. But in recent decades, it's become clear that the movement had multiple starting points and patchwork progress through hundreds of state and local campaigns. African-American women played a, a significant role in both the abolitionist movement and women's suffrage though they were largely excluded from the major white-led suffrage organizations and marginalized in early histories of the movement, if they were mentioned at all. Uh, we see here Nanny Burroughs, an African-American educator, orator, religious leader, civil rights activist, and feminist, and businesswoman. Her speech, How the Sisters Are Hindered from Helping, at the 1900 National Baptist Convention in Virginia, instantly won her fame and recognition. In 1909, she founded the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, DC, and she fought both for racial equality and furthered opportunities for women beyond the duties of domestic housework and continuing to work until her death at the age of 82 in 1961. Great. Um, interestingly, in May 1851, African-American abolitionist Sojourner Truth, and I'm sure you're familiar with that name, spoke at a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio. During her famous speech on the abolition of slavery and the promotion of women's rights, Truth proclaimed, ain't I a woman? Born into slavery in 1797, Isabella Baumfrey, who later changed her name to Sojourner Truth, would become one of the most powerful advocates for human rights in the 19th century. She observed, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. Next slide, thank you. So here we have some extraordinary African-American um, women suffragists. Uh, and I'm gonna read, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them starting with, starting in the upper left. We have Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was born in 1825 and died in 1911. She was an abolitionist, a suffragist, a poet, a teacher, a public school speaker and a writer. And she was one of the first African-American women to be published in the United States. Um, she published her first book of poetry at age 20 and the novel Eola Leroy in 1892, which was widely praised. Um, in the middle at the top row is Anna Julia Cooper. She was born in 1858 and died in 1964. Um, she was born into slavery, uh, but then went on to, to earn um, degrees from Oberlin College, both as an undergrad and a master's degree in 1887, and then a PhD from the Sorbonne in Paris in 1924. She was only the fourth African-American woman, woman um, to earn a doctoral degree. She wrote A Voice from the South, um, and, was, and it was a first articulation of Black feminism, and she's remembered as the mother of Black feminism. Um, and it, this book was, it advanced a vision of self-determination through education and social uplift for African-American women. 
Um, Ida B. Wells is in the upper right. And she was born into slavery six months before Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, an 1884 train ride began her public campaign. She purchased a first class ticket, but was told to move to a smoking car and she was forcibly removed from the train. She purchased um, part ownership of a newspaper in 1887. And then in 1892, three of her friends were lynched and she was run out of town. Um, uh, she moved to Chicago and continued her activism there. In the lower left is Sojourner Truth. Um, she was an abolitionist, suffragist, and former slave, and um, started an, a nationwide lecture tour in 1851. Um, in Akron, Ohio, she gave the speech, Ain't I a Woman? Um, and she criticized and urged men not to fear rights for women. And this became an iconic speech in the, in the women's rights movement. Um, Nanny Helen Burroughs was born to a formerly enslaved couple living in Orange, Virginia. She excelled in school and graduated with honors. Um, and she was turned down for a public school teaching position. She decided to open her own school to educate and train for working African-American women. And she did not rely on, women, on money from wealthy white donors, um, but took donations from black women and children from the community. And, and with that, she was able to open a very successful school called the National Training School for Women and Girls. And in the lower right, we have Elizabeth Piper Ensley, who was an educator and suffragist. She was born in Massachusetts and was a teacher on the Eastern coast of the country, but later moved to Colorado where she achieved prominence as a leader in the Colorado suffrage movement. Um, she was also a journalist, activist, and founder of local women's clubs to support civics causes. It's a remarkable group of women. I just move a, for uh, a, a couple of minutes to look at the work of some very interesting early female illustrators. So 23 years before American women won the right to vote in national elections, illustrators Jessie Wilcox Smith, Elizabeth Shippen Green, and Violet Oakley established a unique communal household based on professional cooperation and personal affection. The three artists met in 1897 when they were all studying with Howard Pyle, the nation's most celebrated illustrator. When their careers began to flourish, the trio rented the Red Rose Inn, a suburban estate on Philadelphia's main line. Faced with the daunting prospect of managing the property, they enlisted the help of their friend Henrietta Cousins, who in this photograph appears to be watering them like three flowers. Uh, and she had no artistic ambition, but she was eager to shoulder the domestic responsibilities that none of the others wanted. So the financial obligations of maintaining the household were considerable, but um, what they decided was to have a binding commitment, uh, which said that the four women promised to stay together, believe it or not, forever. They adopted a common surname, christening themselves the Coggs family, C for Cousins, O for Oakley, G for Green, and S for Smith, and Howard Pyle, their teacher, called them the Red Rose Girls. Their unconventional alliance enabled the artists to establish national reputations while maintaining both the intensive work schedule necessary in a competitive field as well as the genteel lifestyle that in the early 20th century was a hallmark of a successful woman. The three artists collaborated on projects, criticized and encouraged one another and were freed from distracting domestic responsibilities because of Cousins' able management of the property. Next slide, please. As an illustrator, Jesse Wilcox Smith received great respect and achieved financial success. Her illustrations graced the covers and pages of Harper's, Scribner's, Collier's, Women's Home Companion, and many others. And her eventual tenure as cover illustrator for Good Housekeeping lasted 15 years, featuring her idyllic imagery of childhood on nearly 200 covers for the publication. 
Despite Smith's disinterest in teaching and the distaste she actually indicated for interacting, interacting with children, including her grandnieces, who she used as models, many of her most beloved works featured idealized imagery of childhood and motherhood. Smith's robust career included the illustration of nearly 40 books, including such classics as Little Women and The Water Babies, uh, which is the piece that we see here. Next one. Violet Oakley was the only one of the Red Rose Girls to create images on a large scale. She began producing murals and stained glass windows later in her, her career and she provided opportunities, um, which provided her with opportunities that commercial illustration lacked. Her unity mural uh, at the Senator chamber, chamber at the Pennsylvania State Capitol in Harrisburg uh, showcases a strong female figure a significant thematic fo focus in Oakley's work. Uh, remarkably, the murals in the Capitol in Harrisburg um, took Oakley 20 years uh, and they are extremely proud of them there. And if you ever pass through, uh, I strongly recommend uh, stopping into the Capitol building. They're quite extraordinary. She became the second ever female teacher at the prestigious Philadelphia Academy of the Fine Arts. And next slide. Elizabeth Shippen Green's decorative style lent itself to color printing and was sought after for fashion advertising and children's books. During her 44 year career, she notably contributed to the Saturday Evening Post and Ladies Home Journal, and she illustrated many favorite children's stories from The Five Little Pigs uh, and many others to Tales from Shakespeare. In 1901, Green signed a semi-exclusive contract with Harper's Weekly, where she was the first female staffer. Interestingly, she was the only one of the Red Rose girls to ever marry, thereby breaking her pledge, but she did extend her um, engagement for five years uh, delaying her leaving the group. And she continued to work independently even after marriage, uh, which was somewhat unusual at the time. And um, it's, it's sort of reported that the dynamic flow and inspiration that the women had uh, as collaborators was never quite the same after that. Next slide, thank you. So we'll uh, talk a little for a couple of minutes about Norman Rockwell, who um, I would say, unlike many of his illustrator colleagues in mid-century America, who portrayed women as either demure or romantic subjects for the covers of magazines and pages of magazines, um, Rockwell was really an advocate for women and girls by creating strong female protagonists, which he did throughout his career. Here's what I found. In this cover, uh, Rockwell's female subject dominates a game of marbles. And if you look closely, I'd love to uh, see what you find here uh, when you take a look at her marble bag as compared to that of the boys and certainly her expression um, of great determination. But she's kneeling on the ground. She's got sh scuffed shoes uh, and she's decidedly unladylike. And uh, of course, assertive females were fairly popular in magazines of the era when you think about stars like Jean Arthur and Jean Harlow and Joan Crawford. Next slide, thank you. And here is Norman Rockwell's Liberty Girl. Um, she was the embodiment of the new roles that belonged to American women during World War II. And I think just take a minute and notice all of the things that the Liberty Girl is carrying. Um, uh, Rockwell hired a professional model, but he portrayed her as this motivated girl next door. Um, when he did this piece, 310,000 women were employed in the US aircraft industry alone and made up 65% of its total workforce compared to just 1% in the pre-war years. Um, by 1945, nearly one out of every four married women worked outside the home. 
And while these gains were often temporary, um, as females were demobilized at war's end, they did they did make way for for women um, following them. So um, we just love the Liberty Girl and how she's just leaning into uh, every possible project. Next slide, thank you. This is probably one of Norman Rockwell's most iconic paintings. Um, he worked for the Post for 47 years and eventually uh, determined to um, leave the magazine for Look Magazine, which uh, allowed him to voice some of his uh, deepest feelings on the subject of civil rights and equality. Uh, this piece is called The Problem We All Live With, uh, based upon an actual event uh, in which uh, a six-year-old girl named Ruby Bridges in 1960 was the first to integrate uh, her elementary school in Louisiana. And the piece was actually published at the 10th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education ruling, which declared that separate was not equal in America's public schools. So if you notice, uh, Rockwell really places almost full attention on this very determined young girl who actually in real life was escorted to school every day for an entire year by four US Marshals. And um, for those of you who might be interested in Ru Ruby's story, she actually just recently released another book about uh, her story uh, that we will we'll be reading on Monday at a Mar Martin Luther King Day program uh, at the museum or on Zoom at the museum. But the painting um, is interesting in the sense that Ruby did not realize until she was about 19, year old, 19 years old that Rockwell had actually created this work and um, just how powerful it actually was at the time. Thank you. I'll use this opportunity as a reminder and encouragement to any of um, our attendees at any to um, chime in with questions. Um, if you'd like to interject with a comment or question, do please feel free to um, enter anything into the chat box. So we have discussed um, some of the visual media from the women's suffrage movement and some of the phenomenal works by early illustrators um, from women illustrators to Norman Rockwell. And now we transition to um, 20th century and contemporary artists who will see continue to utilize similar visual strategies, combining text and image in eye-catching ways to continue uh, spreading messages of social change and bringing awareness to um, injustices and um, a, a oppression of power. So this is an installation view from Some Days Now, Women, Art and Social Change. And we see the exhibition begins with um, the array of um, posters from the women's suffrage movement and then segues into um, work by 22, 20th century and contemporary artists who are um, who have used their work as platforms for social change and for inspiring conversations like the ones we're having tonight. Okay, so we have seen and we've discussed the um, the aspect of segregation of racism in the women's suffrage movement um, and subsequently, and um, so kind of in transitioning from discussions about the women's suffrage movement to contemporary artists, Faith Ringgold is an artist who has really continued to grapple with this subject matter throughout her career. Um, she is a beloved celebrated American artist and uh, was born in 1930 in Harlem, New York, and um, really grew up in the milieu of the Harlem Renaissance. And so was uh, introduced and exposed to um, fascinating creative poets and uh, musicians and artists at the time and uh, endeavored upon her own um, artistic career even from an early age. So um, coming of age really against the backdrop of the civil rights movement, issues of voting rights, of civil rights, of racial equality, gender equality, um, those informed her work 
profoundly in the 1950s and 60s and continue to do so today. Um, she's very well known for narrative works, um, whether prints, paintings, quilts, and this is a six part series that is featured in Someday Is Now um, that is very characteristic of, um, of her concerns. This was created in 2009. This is a piece called Declaration of Freedom and Independence. And Faith Ringel describes this work as one that she created after the 2008 presidential election in which President Obama was elected. And she talks about this being one of the most difficult pieces that she has ever made in her career in that uh, she sought to explore aspects of the Declaration of Independence and some of these idealized notions of our nation's founding, like the notion that all men are created equal with her own perspectives as a black woman acknowledging the long history of slavery, racism, as well as gender and racial discrimination that has rendered true equality elusive for so many. So in each of these six uh, works that you see here, uh, she has juxtaposed uh, images from the uh, Declaration of Independence or from um, American history and is contrasting those with depictions of African-Americans fight for equality, fight, fight for those rights that are assured by the Declaration of Independence. So very briefly, we'll just take a quick look at the um, work at the top left um, called All Men Are Created Equal. And we see King Charles III of England towering over his subjects who are presumably colonists who flee to America for freedom. And on the right is an image of a slave ship bound for America. So Faith Ringgold is really underscoring this notion that um, all men are not created equal, that the equality extended to colonists was not done so for African slaves. Particularly relevant for our discussion tonight is the central image in the top row. And this piece is called, and women, question mark. In this work, she depicts two leading women's rights activists. On the left, we see Abigail Adams. And on the right is Sojourner Truth, who we've spoken about a number of times in tonight's talk. And uh, both of the portraits are overwritten with the women's own writings about women's rights, advocating for women's rights. So uh, Sojourner Truth is overwritten with her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman? So this is, way, this is Faith Ringgold's way of really emphasizing the importance of text and image, uh, words and image in bringing awareness to these important issues. Along the same lines is um, Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson's work, which uh, again combines text and image in really interesting ways. And it's impossible uh, to not think back to the posters from the women's suffrage movement, uh, the protest banners and posters that declared messages of social change. And here, uh, many years later in 2012, um, this work is operating in much the same way. Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson was a native of Columbus, Ohio, and her work spoke to the concerns of her local community, but many of those concerns were quite universal. So while this piece depicts a Human Rights Day rally, it feels as if it could have been uh, a scene from a women's suffrage march or a civil rights march. We see figures holding up signs that declare vote, power to the people, occupy the dream, Human Rights Day rally 2012. And in addition to incorporating these um, text-based elements, she also incorporated collage in really interesting ways, utilizing uh, buttons, incorporating fabric, even plastic bags as a way to really interweave the fabric of everyday life, of the urban landscape with her own work, really combining uh, um, art and life in interesting ways. And so Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson is, I think in this work, emphasizing the importance of enfranchising all those uh, American citizens who seek to have a voice in a place in, uh, in American society. So Faith Ringgold and Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson really came into prominence in the 1960s and dedicated much of their work to the concerns of um, African Americans and women. In the 1960s and 70s, another artist, Corita Kent, uh, became known for her concerns with civil rights as well as women's rights and um, also against the emergence of the Vietnam War, 
her, uh, her advocacy for peace, her protests for peace. She was based in Los Angeles and at the age of 18, she joined a Catholic convent and she had studied art. She taught art at the Catholic convent and meanwhile took up a printmaking practice on her own. And she was very attracted to printmaking because of its democratic qualities. It was affordable to create, to reproduce, to distribute, to purchase. And she was a voracious reader. So we see um, frequent appropriation of texts in her work. And she threw texts from scripture, from poetry, from folk songs, from popular media. And she combined it. She would juxtapose that text with images that she uh, would appropriate from popular media like Time Magazine and Newsweek that depicted current events. So we see a number of vertically oriented works uh, displayed here. These were from a series that she titled Heroes and Sheroes that uh, celebrated some of the leading activists like Martin Luther King Jr. and also touched on um, some of the more painful aspects of American life at the time, including scenes from the Vietnam War. We see at the lower right, uh, a Vietnam uh, War soldier with the text, where have all the flowers gone? Corita Kent was always considered uh, on the margins of the pop art movement, but only in recent years has been recognized as a much more pivotal figure in that movement. And her work is incredibly inspiring. At top right, we see a print that uh, spells or that uses the phrase, hope arouses as nothing else can arouse a passion for the possible. And that notion that hope can arouse a passion for the possible is one that um, I found very inspiring. And in fact, uh, the famous American artist, Ben Sean called Corita Kent, uh, a joyous revolutionary. Also combining text and image is this particular work uh, in, in a completely different way. This is by Yoko Ono, who of course emerged in the 1960s and 70s as well at the same time as, as Karita Kent and many of these other artists for her involvement in anti-war protests during the Vietnam War. Um, she launched a an international, a worldwide peace campaign with her late husband, John Lennon. And so this work is outside of that peace campaign, but still related to, to this idea um, of spreading peace and goodwill. Um, Yoko Ono is known for her work that often invited the audience to, to complete the artwork or invited uh, viewer participation. And this is incredibly characteristic of that tendency. This is called Wish Tree. And this was conceived by Yoko Ono in 1996. It has been staged countless times around the globe in different, ex in different exhibitions. And uh, this particular piece is a, an invitation to uh, the audience to collaborate on a monument to our wishes, large and small. So visitors are invited to come to the museum, uh, take one of these paper tags, write down a wish, hang it from the branches, and at the end of the exhibition, all of the wishes are compiled and returned to Yoko Ono, who archives the wishes in a peace tower in Reykjavik, Iceland. And so since the piece's conception in 1996, over 1 million wishes have been accumulated. And in the course of our exhibition alone, over 3,000 wishes have been hung from the tree. So now moving into the 1980s and to slightly more recent years, we see a generation of artists, including Barbara Kruger, Jenny Holzer, the Gorilla Girls, Carrie Mae Weems, and others who are responding to a lot of the, the, the visual culture of their time um, in a moment when Americans are being bombarded by images on TV and advertising on the internet and um, are beginning to see some of the strategies utilized by advertising and marketing that normalize uh, uh, discrimination, that reinforce gender norms, that misrepresent members of society or perhaps leave out members of society altogether. So these artists were looking at some of these problematic aspects of, of marketing <laughs> and uh, were appropriating these marketing aesthetics and revealing some of those problems in their work. So. Barbara Kruger is an artist who began her career as an art director for Condé Nast Publications. And as she segued into a career as a fine artist, she took many of the, the tools um, that she had uh, developed, that she'd gathered during her time as an art director and continued to use them in her fine art. So 
Um, throughout her career, she's continued to utilize found photographs. These are not her own, um, own images, her own original images. And she combines those found photographs uh, with text to address injustice and inequalities. Um, this piece, I think, is particularly fitting for this discussion and for this idea of um, you know, this fight for equality. If you read the, the text from top to bottom, left to right, it spells, we will no longer be seen and not heard. At the very same time that Barbara Kruger was uh, coming into uh, recognition, the Gorilla Girls, an anonymous artist collective, was formed in 1985 in New York City to fight discrimination in the arts. And again, we see some of those same strategies, the combination of text and image to uh, reveal injustices in society. So the Gorilla Girls are, are well known and they retain their anonymity by donning gorilla masks and taking the names of deceased female artists. And in the 1980s, they were responding to the disproportionately low representation of women and artists of color in uh, museums and in galleries, and they were highly effective in um, how they inspired conversations and held institutions accountable by looking at museum practices. Uh, for instance, we'll take a look at the, the poster that's kind of in the middle there. How many women had one person exhibitions at New York City museums last year? So we see in 1985 at prominent museums, 0010 exhibitions featuring uh, women artists, solo women artists. And they have continued to be incredibly uh, prolific and active even up to today. So we see in 2015, they revisited <laughs> this same question, how many women had one person exhibitions at New York City museums last year? And while there's been some progress, we see that the numbers are still rather dismal. Uh, so the Gorilla Girls have really campaigned uh, uh, consistently throughout the past decades uh, and have distributed these posters outside of the institutions that they are uh, kind of interrogating and really spread these messages um, throughout the public. They utilized humor uh, to, to sort of get the attention of the public and have been incredibly effective. So we were excited to be able to feature the Gorilla Girls as part of our exhibition programming. Um, but the, as part of this show, the New Britain Museum of American Art was also able to acquire the Gorilla Girls portfolio complete 1985 to 2016. So this will now be part of our permanent collection moving forward. The last section of Someday is Now uh, brings us to our contemporary moment and uh, includes the work of predominantly millennial and Generation X artists. Many of are first or second generation Americans. So we see these artists confronting questions about American society and citizenship and womanhood uh, from very cross-cultural perspectives. So Colleen Smith is an amazing artist who's based in LA. She trained as a filmmaker, but increasingly in recent years has become uh, more of an object maker. So we see in her exhibitions uh, banners and neon pieces and, um, you know, immersive environments with film projection. And in 2019 began this new series of neons that uh, responds very much to what is happening in our current moment. Um, this series uh, thus far has been dedicated to Black women who have been the victims of police violence. So something that was interesting about uh, the planning of the show was that it took place, planning took place over quarantine. And so uh, our conversations with artists and with lenders were, were more extended and we were able to add works that were really responding to current events in real time. And, and these are two of the works that were uh, incorporated into the show rather late in the game because they felt so, um, they felt so resonant with um, what occurred during the summer uh, with the protests following the death of, of George Floyd. So in the work at the top right, we see the text, I Will Light Up Your Life. This is a work called um, I Will Light Up Your Life for Sandra Bland. And in the piece, Colleen Smith conflates two phrases that alternate. One is, I will light you up. And the other is, you light up or I will light up your life. So I will light you up has, uh, it implies this impending violence. And You Light Up My Life refers to a 1977 ballad that Colleen Smith describes as one that as a child was very evocative in her mind um, of the white ideal 
of this sort of romantic, hopeful life that, that white people in America could experience. So in this piece, she's kind of rendering a more violent phrase, hopeful, and also speaking to her racialized experience growing up in America. Uh, this piece is in Some Day Is Now, and, and especially for me, evokes some of those early suffrage posters and the, the way in which members of the suffrage movement organized in very strategic ways to uh, work with art directors and, and marketing agents to uh, produce material, visual materials that they felt properly represented their efforts. And so in a way, I think this work by Martin Gutierrez uh, functions in a similar way. Martin Gutierrez is a young Guatemalan American artist, um, a trans artist. And in this piece, indigenous woman that we see at the center, Martin uh, uh, functioned as a, or took the role of a magazine editor, photographer, stylist, and model uh, to create what is essentially a glossy fashion magazine that's over a hundred pages and that uh, mimics magazines like uh, W, this high fashion magazine. And um, she is the, the sole subject throughout and yet like a chameleon, she changes in various fashion spreads. So we see at the far right, a, an image from uh, indigenous woman. This is one of the fashion spreads where she's really excavating different facets of her own identity. And finally, this is the last work that visitors encounter in Someday Is Now. This is a piece by Jenny Holzer, who has um, really been celebrated for decades now for finding innovative ways of getting her message out into the public domain, out of the traditional art spaces, out of museums and galleries, and into the public, public sphere through apparel campaigns, through projected light on corporate buildings, and this is a project that she created called Vote Your Future. This is from 2018, in which she converted a double-decker bus, as well as moving vans and theater marquees um, to depict phrases that addressed current events, whether climate change or gay rights or voting rights. So as the last, pe as the last piece that visitors encounter in Some Day Is Now, this is really meant to uh, you know, remind us how far we've come. This is the centennial of women's suffrage in America. Remind us of um, all the efforts made by the suffragists 100 years ago. And um, our duty, our responsible, uh, responsibility to continue um, advocating for equality and for, um, for uh, social justice for all, uh, for the benefit of, of generations to come. So with that, I will segue to you, Mary. Oh, you're muted, Mary. Sorry about that, um, Lisa. The, the Unity Project at the Norman Rockwell Museum is the first project um, that we where we have commissioned artists and uh, in the spirit of great poster campaigns of the past, um, we commissioned six contemporary artists to create posters um, uh, to inspire people to vote in the 2020 pres presidential election. And four of them are women. And this first one is by Miley Dagnan. Um, she wrote in this piece, I wanted to illustrate a scene of strong women performing their civic duty of voting in this time of utmost uncertainty. And she said she very intentionally had um, her, the girls in this, in this image wear masks. And she said, this is not a time to be silent or to sit this one out. Um, she's an award-willing illustrator uh, based in Baltimore, Maryland, and she loves drawing uh, both girls and pattern. Um, next one is Yuko Shimizu. And in her poster design, Yuko Shimizu reimagined the Statue of Liberty as a superheroine draped in the American flag and her torch, um, if you look closely, replaced by a flaming fist. And she wrote, each individual is a superhero. This is the beauty of democracy and we have to keep this intact. I wanted to create a poster that is unapologetically American, powerful and hopeful. Um, a Japanese illustrator, Yuko is based in New York City and she teaches at the School of Visual Arts. And the next one is by Whitney Sherman. 
and Whitney, um, oh. I think, uh, ah, there we go. Um, Whitney, she wrote, when thinking about voting today, I'm mindful of the need to be vigilant and of the energetic beauty that comes from everyone doing their part to be good citizens. And she found inspiration um, in initiatives like the Women's March on Washington. Uh, she is the one illustrator of the six who included a nod to climate change, which you see in the background. Um, and she wrote, to vote means to participate in the experiment of democracy, an experiment that doesn't continue on its own. It needs each and every one of us to exist. And she is an illustrator, educator, and author and chair of the MFA in illustration practice at Maryland Institute College of Art. And the next one is Anita Kuntz, who was born in Canada, and she became a citizen of the United States 15 years ago. And she wrote, there are so many amazing cultures within this country. And the most important thing and the thing that makes everyone feel included is to vote. She's internationally known for her art and has created imagery for Time, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker and The New York Times and many others. Um, and then we wanted to end on one image that really captured our attention. This is by Bob Stack uh, and it's, uh, You'll probably notice it's an nod to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a national hero and advocate for women's rights who spent nearly three decades on our country's um, Supreme Court and five decades as a tireless scholar, teacher and advocate for equality. And to commemorate her, Bob said he needed to think of a graphic metaphor that embodied Ginsburg's life and legacy. He wanted something that was honest and no nonsense like Ginsburg. And he landed on her lace collar, a symbol not just of Ginsburg, but of women everywhere. And um, the result is this image that quietly references Ginsburg, Ginsburg's iconic look in a way that's instantly recognizable and also emphasizes the emotional weight of her absence. And if you look really closely, um, the, the lace of the collar is actually the um, symbol for women. So. It's just been a total pleasure to be with you. And I think Lisa is invite questions now. Yes, Mary, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And I should tell um, viewers that we've been privileged to uh, collaborate on a, a presentation like this uh, a few months ago. And we're very eager to have an opportunity to present this material again. So I suppose um, I'd love to invite uh, viewers to ask any questions they um, they may wish to, to interject with. And perhaps also, Mary, I also have a question for you um, now that now that we have a, a few moments. Um, it's remarkable the synergy between the programming at Norman Rockwell Museum and the programming the, that the New Britain Museum of American Art has presented in 2020 and going forward. So I'd love to, to get a little bit of a, a sense as to how how your programs evolved, how your exhibitions around the subject matter uh, evolved, if this has been kind of consistent in uh, your exhibitions in the past year, this focus on women artists, women illustrators, really celebrating their contribution, or if there has been greater emphasis in recent years around the 2020 centennial and around this kind of national reckoning, this um, effort to increasing representation of women in, uh, in museums. Yeah, Lisa, I think that's such a great question. And I have to say that um, you know, we are, we are uh, in it together, recognizing that, that museums need to really evaluate and um, rethink our work. And so um, it's a constant conversation for us um, to look now at who is missing from our collection. Um, we, know, we, of course, are Norman Rockwell Museum, but we also um, are the Museum of American Illustration Art. So um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a huge priority to be looking at women artists and making sure that they're represented in the collection and that we understand the history of um, women illustrators and also now people of color and, and um, traditionally subordinated groups. I, uh, it's Reinventing. So, I, so, so we'll hope we have more opportunities to, to collaborate together. Um, our, you know, I will, I will share that um, while this wasn't a, a 
necessarily as great a priority four years ago or five years ago. Um, it was through the process of undertaking a collections analysis uh, where we discovered that only about 14% of the artists in our collection were women artists. Mm. And so um, after, after kind of making that um, uh, discovery about the composition of our permanent collection, we have really uh, made an effort to focus more on um, exhibitions that will bring attention to the great contributions of women artists, but also making acquisitions. But it's a slow process. <laughs> it certainly isn't one that can happen overnight. Um, so are there any things that are coming up at the Norman Rockwell Museum that uh, that our attendees should know about? Any plugs, anything that's coming up? Yes, well, I think um, this Monday we have um, the artist, uh, we, we are celebrating Martin Luther King Day with a um, family program reading about um, the story of Ruby Bridges. And you, some of some of the audience may have seen the meme that the young artist Bria Grohler made of Ruby and Kamala Harris. Mm. Kamala breaking the glass ceiling uh, with yes. So Bria will actually be on the program with us and talking about her meme and and we'll be talking about how um, iconic illustration art, um, you know, one image uh, inspires the next image. And, and so I think that will be fun. Um, this weekend, actually this evening, you can <laughs> look at our um, Norman Rockwell Museum YouTube channel and, and listen to a very exciting um, conversation about anti-fascist art. And tomorrow we have a symposium with, with artists and scholars all um, from 10 to 1, which will also be live streamed. So those are a few things in the near future. Um, but of course, always look at our nrm.org website and um, lots, lots happening all the time. How about you, Lisa? What are you guys, what are you up to? And I, and I have to say, we are so inspired by your work. And oh. this, this exhibit was just um, fantastic. Well, uh, we're, we're so delighted to be able to expand upon these conversations with the Norman Rockwell Museum, with you and Stephanie. Uh, I will encourage all those who are tuning in tonight to come to the museum if they can. The, the exhibition Sunday is now Women, Art, and Social Change is we're really in the home stretch. Um, the show is open for just a little bit more than a week now. It closes on January 24th. So uh, do feel welcome to come to the museum, uh, go to the website, purchase a timed uh, ticketed reservation, or visit our website and uh, tune in for many of the programs that have happened, that are recorded, um, like the one we've presented tonight. Once some days now, Women Art and Social Change closes, we do have um, two really phenomenal shows coming up. One is a Helen Frankenthaler Late Works exhibition that opens on February 11th. And in May, we will be featuring a solo show um, of Jennifer Wen Ma's work. And that will uh, incorporate stories of New Britain residents um, kind of describing their experience of the, uh, the last year, the events of the last year. So it will be very, resonant, I think, with the, the experiences that we've all had. Um, we have an additional show up right now of contemporary artist Chantel Martin, and that is up through mid-April. So there's a lot to see. I can't wait to get up to the Norman Rockwell Museum. And I just want to thank you again so much, Mary. I extend my thanks to Stephanie. And uh, when we wrap this, I'm actually going to tune in for your symposium tonight. So oh, how wonderful. Back. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to working with you. Um, like yes additionally in the future. So yes, <laughs> thank you to the audience for being on and we hope everyone has a great night. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary. And uh, good night. Hope to see you again soon. Good night.